Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Wheatley Price, a medical oncologist and president of Lung Cancer Canada. Welcome to our podcast series called Lung Cancer Voices. In this series of podcasts, I'm interviewing patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, some of the leading lung cancer researchers in the country, indeed in the world, to highlight important and relevant issues facing those affected by lung cancer. In this podcast, I'm speaking with Dr. Jack West, an oncologist and head of the Thoracic Oncology Program at the Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle. He's a former Fulbright Scholar, widely respected leader in lung cancer, and actually I've asked Jack to come on the podcast not because of his uh, work as a, in clinical trials and lung cancer research, but more because of his work in bringing patients and clinicians together to provide up-to-date information, uh, drive research, and work in partnership. And that's because Dr. West is the founder and president of a nonprofit called Grace, which we're going to talk about, also another um, group called Beacon Medical Interchange. So the topic of this podcast is patients, caregivers, and clinicians in partnership. Uh, Jack, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. My pleasure. So can you tell me a little bit about Grace and what Grace is? Um, what was the need that you saw that, that led to the evolution? Sure. GRACE stands for Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. It started a little over a decade ago, and my idea for it was based on it being a time when lung cancer care was getting increasingly specialized, enough that I was seeing patients for a second or third opinion who were sometimes getting treatments that I thought was questionable or not getting treatments that I thought were really important. And it wasn't clear whether that was because the docs they were primarily receiving treatment from were not able to keep up with the advances or were concerned about the toxicities being too much work or had a financial incentive that might be uh, dissonant with what was best for the patient. But none of those was, was a great for the patient. And so the idea was, how can we bring down the gap between the best treatment available and what patients were actually getting in practice? Obviously, we want to educate docs as much as possible, but over the last 10, 15 years, it's only become more difficult, if not impossible, to expect docs seeing 10 or 15 different kinds of cancer in a day to keep up with all of these advances. It's an enviable problem. But at the same time, patients, caregivers, everyone can go online and find information. The problem being that often that information wasn't uh, as credible as we would like or you just didn't know the source. And so what I wanted to do was ensure that there was uh, a, a resource where patients and caregivers could find the most timely, credible, reliable information directly from experts and know they could trust it and have it be free for them. And not just where I was coming from in the US, but have it be available in Canada and all over the world because the concept was making digital information and sharing it is almost free. It's certainly remarkably efficient. And you can reach tons of people over time and space rather than having a one-time conversation with somebody and that being a benefit to the person in the room, but it evaporating into the walls after that. So that was the idea. And I had a lot of information about what, what narrow field I did. And I could upload that and make it available for free to people. And I could have colleagues do the same. Uh, and it was relatively little effort for them, but it could be of tremendous benefit for people, especially who don't have access to somebody with a particular expertise in lung cancer or whatever else. And even if they did, they could have basically a, a, a pseudo second opinion to corroborate what they were hearing from their own physicians. So if I get this right, that, that goal then is to have credible, reliable, up-to-date information so we can tell patients when they ask all of these questions and want to know where to go, we we'll say, well, look, go to cancergrace.org mm -hmm. rather than uh, the, the sort of, um, sometimes, you know, I'll see someone in, in the clinic and they'll say, oh, well, my, 
my next door neighbor went online and they think I should do this. And that's exactly it. I, I know the reality is that people are going to go online. We do that all the time for our movie reviews or uh, restaurants or whatever. We, we are interested in the wisdom of the crowd, but I don't think that's really the way that you should be getting healthcare information. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the loudest voices online are not the most credible, and people see that you know, alkaline therapy or, uh, or cannabis oil or all the sorts of things that are widely shared non-information, disinformation, based on a few anecdotes of people doing well combined with some reasonably credible preclinical rationale, People who don't have the scientific training might consider that to be uh, a leading recommendation and because their sister's friend's cousin also said that. But th that's not how you should be gathering healthcare information, especially if you can have information from people who eat, sleep, live, and breathe this as an expertise available to you as an alternative. And so to me, that was really the point that, yeah, people are going to go to whatever they can find. We need, uh, as physicians, as oncologists, to provide some good alternatives to garbage online that people can find, know who is saying it, what their, what their qualifications are. And Grace uh, and, and many other organizations increasingly are starting to do this to, to reach out to patients. Uh, will say, here's who I am, here's what, what I do, here is why we recommend this treatment. And it, it tries to make it accessible language for patients, but it explains the basics of clinical trials that, have, uh, that are establishing new standards of care so that people can understand, not just because I'm your father, that's why, but because there's actually a reason why we recommend what we do. I guess a buzz phrase for the our current time is fake news. So it's trying yeah, to avoid that. Exactly. So, so what would you say have been the big, big successes for Grace and, and maybe a little bit more detail, what kind of resources um, are provided for patients and caregivers? What, what have they most appreciated in, in sort of feedback that you've heard? The offerings from Grace have evolved over more than a decade and they should. Uh, the idea was just to provide whatever platform was the easiest to get expert information out to patients. And that started out with me uh, doing uh, really a blog format, uh, not because I wanted to detail where I ate or something like that, but because a blog platform allows someone who isn't a coder to make a website quickly and put that content out. So I used that. And over a course of two, three, four years, uploaded just about every topic that I knew of in uh, lung cancer management or general supportive care on that. And, and that was a huge volume of material. But over the last few years, that has evolved to be more audio content. And uh, so we've, we've had webinars with screen captures and we've had uh, video content. Increasingly, now we do more video uh, that is capturing experts where they are, and that's sometimes case-based discussions, that's sometimes a kind of talking head, five-minute piece. Increasingly, what we're doing is uh, a lung cancer video library that is a modular array of material that people can dive down and find everything they want about EGFR or ALK and start with the info about what is it or what's the treatment first line and then what can you do second line and later and re-biopsy questions or it could be managing brain metastases or pleural effusions but these are all in three or five minute clips with the idea also that uh, so, so they're digestible pieces um, and uh, they can be replaced as new information comes in that changes what was current in 2017 and their new standards in 2019. Uh, we, we don't have to replace a one hour lecture. You just take down a, a five minute piece and replace it with a newer five minute piece to, to cover what is the most current management of today. So that's, uh, it, it will continue to evolve and uh, I think we're going to be doing more audio like like uh, you are doing. Uh, 
I think with Amazon and all these other platforms, I think we're going to be getting a lot more of our content while we are you know, cooking dinner, exercising, driving on the train, whatever. I think that the great thing about audio is you can multitask very well. It's very amenable to uh, to uh, portability, you know, and we get all of our stuff on mobile devices. So uh, whatever it is, the concept of delivering information efficiently to patients everywhere is the goal, and that specific modality is going to change over time. So most physicians uh, that I know don't do what I'm doing now and what you've been doing with uh, Grace, what would you say are the biggest things that you've learned personally about working in this kind of area and providing educational content for patients and family members? Does it make you a better doctor? I think it definitely makes me a better doctor because, uh, frankly, I think that being able to communicate effectively in simpler language is something that is a very important distillation, a skill for patients, but it, it applies very well to everyone else. I think that lots of people, including physicians, just appreciate someone being able to convey information as simple concepts, analogies, things like that. I mean, I, I'm guilty of mixing metaphors all day long, but I think they at least make things memorable. And, and the goal is to convey complex information uh, as, as accessibly as possible. The Grace content is definitely explicitly for patients and caregivers, but I don't think it's dumbed down particularly. It's the kind of thing that is completely useful to all sorts of healthcare professionals. And, uh, and I have oncologists come up to me and say they find this stuff really useful, and it should be. It's, I think one of the tenets, the core ideas, is that patients ideally can become very sophisticated about their disease and become active participants in their care and not just passive with the current of whatever happens to them. And so uh, with that, the distinction between information valuable for patients and information for physicians is blurred or goes away. So Jack, let me ask you about some well-reported patient groups that are now have this literacy and are, are starting to drive research questions. So the ones that are probably best known in lung cancer are the Ross Wonders, the EGF resistors, RET renegades, etc. What are your thoughts on, on these groups and uh, what they've achieved and how you see this evolving? I think that <coughs> online patient groups are, I think, inevitable uh, and a great idea overall. The, the more uncommon to rare uh, a mutation or a subgroup is, the more inclined they are to self-aggregate online. There's just too much geographical uh, distribution and uh, too little density, so it just makes sense for people to find each other online. And uh, these groups share information, uh, and it, it can be tremendous. I think that the fact is, Ross Wonders will almost always know more about their disease than any doctor they're talking to, except for one or two docs, uh, you know, in a country or the world who, who are major experts in Ross One, and everyone else does not have the time or uh, ability to focus on learning everything that's written about the Ross One experience and phase one trials. So yeah, it makes sense. Uh, the, the, I think the critical thing is to ensure that information is curated well and it's not something where uh, you know, the, the discussion boards are taken over by people pressing for cannabis oil or uh, misinformation that immunotherapy is going to be a leading choice over targeted therapy, but I don't think that's happening particularly uh, because many of the people leading these groups are remarkably sophisticated and they they are appropriate, deserving leaders of, of these communities and they share great information. I also think it, it changes the dynamic between the patients and the doctors where the doc needs to acknowledge that the patient is going to have a ton of credible information and the patient needs to not consider their doctor an idiot for not knowing everything there is to know about ROS1, which is a 1% population in lung cancer. So 
you have to work as a team together. It means that, uh, you know, the patient comes with information and the doc and the patient work together to put it in context and figure out where to go with it. Uh, the other great thing about the online groups, besides sharing information, you know, with people who have the time and motivation to learn everything they can about their their rare cancer, is that they can accelerate research. When, when a company has an agent that they're interested in studying in ROS1, it used to be that it would be thought of as impractical or impossible to do a phase one trial in ROS1 uh, because it would take forever to get you know, 20 or 30 patients on a trial. But now, if you have a treatment that is very promising for a specific narrow population and you can reach a large group, dozens of those patients with that pop, you know, dozens or more, they'll go to wherever they need to go to participate in the trial and get it done incredibly quickly. So it, it, it facilitates clinical research, accelerates it in a way that makes it newly possible to do studies on rare populations that we could never do before. Hey, that's a fantastic point of online groups not only existing to share information and support, but to be able to be a, a conduit to, to aid research. W with research um, questions and groups like these ones we've been talking about, I sometimes wondered, you know, historically research questions have been driven by academic groups or by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, do you think it's reasonable to say that patient-driven research might ask better questions because they're questions that are really directly most relevant to those who have, who've got most to lose or gain? Um, or is a degree of separation and sort of scientific experience um, more valid? Um, how do you think the regulatory bodies would see this? There's a kind of a lot of questions wrapped up in there. Yeah, I, I do think it changes how we approach research. And I we are seeing a lot more focus on patient reported outcomes. And I think that's appropriate. I think that uh, bringing the patient voice and the caregiver voice into clinical research and trying to be grounded in what's important to patients is critical. But at the same time, I, I think that uh, I, I would not want the rigor of of uh, academic oncologists to be out of that. I think that you know, one concern I would have is having pharmaceutical companies in tight allegiance with patients as a way of kind of short-circuiting the process and using soft endpoints like quality. You know, quality of life is important, but if something doesn't improve survival and something clearly measurable, uh, for a drug that costs fifteen thousand dollars a month, I think it's a real problem. So I think that I, I just would say it's a false distinction that we don't need to have. Of uh, this is work that's done with or by uh, patients versus uh, physicians. I think that we just need to form alliances of the Ross Wonders or the Alkies or EGF or EGF resistors. You know, that that can be with uh, physicians to collaborate to define clinical trials that include both patient reported outcomes and the traditional outcomes that we've looked at. And it, it shouldn't be an either or, it can be a both and. Great. And that just makes intuitive sense, doesn't it? That, that to work together. Um, I guess my, my last question then, um, asking you to maybe look into a crystal ball. We've talked about ways that patients and caregivers and uh, physicians and healthcare professionals are, are working uh, more together. Do you see um, other roles that patients and caregivers are going to take on in the future that have traditionally been associated with the, the healthcare profession as we move into this sort of patient-centered era where your patient experience is valued highly alongside those traditional outcomes? Could you, can you see the next step? There's a, there's a book, I think, says, uh, Doctor, the patient will see you now. Yes, right. <laughs> Eric Topol's book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think that what I foresee is just broader acceptance of the things we've been trying to roll out for a long time. Back when I had started Grace a little over a decade ago, there was nearly no content specifically for patients and caregivers, and now there's a lot more focus on that. And 
companies are focusing on creating content for patients. Uh, there's, uh, you know, CME companies are working on creating content not just for the professional community but for the patient community in tandem. And, uh, and we're seeing professional societies increasingly integrate patients and patient groups into, into the meetings. And I think it's, it's enriching the experience for everybody. And so there used to be, uh, there used to be just doc uh, online groups or professional meetings. And there were patient groups online or meetings. But never the twain shall meet. They were just in completely non-overlapping Venn diagrams. And to me, one of the things I thought was always uh, unique or at least special about Grace uh, was that that was a place where doctors and patients communicated together. And that's not as rare as it used to be. And I think that's a great thing. We will see more patients being invited to speak at professional conferences. There being tracks on patient advocacy and online groups and 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 the people who are conducting research both the uh, the companies and the uh, principal investigators are seeing the incredible tangible benefits of having online group partners to help facilitate the research they want to get done so i i just see it as uh, that distinction being blurred and i think that over time more oncologists and probably physicians in general are going to become comfortable with the idea that they aren't going to know everything about their about what their patient has. Uh, it doesn't mean they're a bad doctor. It just is the reality that you know lung cancer is not just the thing you give the same regimen for everybody and you get about the same lousy results, but rather it's it's many different subgroups. It's way more complex, and people with those rare subgroups will be motivated and have the ability to find out tons and tons of information and are now going to be a partner in that and not just it being a unidirectional presentation of here's what you should do and the patient nodding and saying okay doc whatever you say that's those days are gone well great thank you uh thank you for really all your thoughts and insights today and for joining our uh, and for joining our podcast thank you again for joining us Lung Cancer Voices was made possible in part by a generous donation from Marielle and Nick Burris. Thanks to our producer, Ryan Mullen. Please send us your feedback, like and follow us on Facebook at LungCan and on Twitter at LungCancer underscore can. For more information about lung cancer or to donate, volunteer or share your story, visit our webpage at LungCancer.